Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those of you joining us on the West Coast. Uh, welcome to the uh, RMUS Spot at Work webinar. As some of you uh, regular viewers may have noticed, I'm not, in fact, John McBride. I'm actually Kevin Todrell. So sorry to uh, John's fan club. You are going to be stuck with me and some wonderful uh, special guests today. Anyway, today our focus is on a really, really exciting new product the spot robot, and most particular, some really brave souls who are the early adopters for this particular product. So we're joined with an all-star panel of, uh, of guests, including Tim Dykstra from Boston Dynamics, Eddie Joe from Ontario Power Generation, Matt McKinnon from UAS Inc. on behalf of Kid Creek. So we'll introduce them a little bit more later, but they'll be talking about some specifics. We are uh, unfortunately not going to be joined by some uh, of our law enforcement guests, Obviously, you've seen a lot of uh, spot uh, news from NYPD and some other departments. We'd hope to have um, them on, uh, but they will not, in fact, be able to join us. But I do have some uh, some interesting shots we can show for you public safety people. So don't worry that you will um, that you'll feel left out. So really, as we look at spot in terms of adopting how how we want to do it, there's kind of a process and you'll you'll see that in the theme from our guests today. Really, the first thing we're looking at is showing where Spot can go. And when you see this, it's pretty amazing, uh, especially when you compare it to, to other types of ground robots that we've, we've dealt with traditionally in these applications in the future. So first thing is, what can it do? Where can it go? The second thing then is looking at how we can automate those missions. So how can we make it repeatable, simple, and get the same data over and over again? The third step in these is now we start looking at what kind of sensors can we integrate? And Spot has a great suite of sensors. Tim will talk a little bit about that from visual to some upcoming IR sensors. But with the open API, we're already looking at a number of different sensors to be integrated that, uh, that Matt will talk a little bit about. Everything you can imagine uh, that will work on the payload uh, will work on, on Spot. So we're looking forward to testing that. So that's kind of step three. Step four is then can we automate those sensor missions? And there's some wonderful projects that are being scoped now for fully automated uh, inspection and patrolling applications. Very, very exciting. And then the final step five will be, uh, and we've certainly got some university partners looking at this now, is really using AI and machine learning to, uh, to be able to analyze some of this data. So really, really exciting stuff as we, as we talk through it. So I want to start off real quickly. I'm just going to share with you a couple of uh, uh, homemade videos that we we uh, we shot as we were testing this. Um, they tend to be they tend to be um, uh, more oriented towards the public safety. But this is a location uh, called Festi, and Festi is where the uh, the fire training happens for the Pearson Airport here in Toronto. So this is actually a, a burning aircraft simulator. And this is a great thing where you can see Spot hop right up that wing and see how far he gets. So that is uh, that was a really, really fun one. So that'll give you an idea of some of the applications. The other one, and this is where we, we, we talk through Spot um, compared, to, uh, compared to traditional ground robots. This, this on itself is just Spot getting into a bus. Not, not something that looks interesting at all, but we had some SWAT testing and they were testing one of the ground-based robots. And that particular robot took them 15 minutes just to get into that bus. And you're seeing this in real time. And this was just walking up and randomly getting onto the bus. So really, really simple, really, really fast, uh, way ahead in terms of performance with comparable products. Really, really exciting there. So that was just a couple that I wanted to uh, I wanted to share with you, so you get to see uh, see the the uh, entertainment that we get when we're uh, we're doing some of these testing. And thanks to uh, to Andy Olson and his group at uh, at Sarah for uh, for arranging that testing at Festi. So for you public safety individuals, we've got more testing data, so you can uh, you can just reach out directly um, if you're interested. So without further ado, I would like to uh, pass along the floor to the legendary Tim Dykstra of Boston Dynamics. that will talk about some of the Boston Dynamics 
uh, spots at work so far. So Tim, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate you having me on uh, here today, and and happy to join you here. Um, so so yeah, as as Kevin mentioned, you know, really wanted to to dive into the use cases um, and and start talking through that a little bit more with you guys. Um, just a quick overview before I do that. Um, RMUS did a great webinar a few months ago, so if you want the to learn the basics of Spot, I encourage you to go check that out. Um, but you know, really, when it comes down to it, we've we've spent many many years, 28 years uh, in existence, but uh, the last eight or nine years really building Spot to make sure that it's it's the right tool for the job. Um, you know, it's able to handle extreme mobility, as as Kevin showed in some of those. Uh, um, videos. It can navigate sites. Uh, we provide a very intuitive user interface to allow you to do easily automate data capture, um, examine remote or hazardous environments with ease. And, and most importantly, as Kevin mentioned, we've, we've made it an open platform. Uh, we, we feel it's important to have payloads, uh, a variety of payloads, a flexibility of what payloads that you can add to it. And, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but you know we're we're excited that we've made this right tool uh, to to for many jobs. But what's more exciting in the last several months is seeing real users that that are putting Spot to work, um, getting it dirty and and putting it uh, putting it out in the field. And that's really the focus of this webinar. Um, I'm going to walk through a couple um, end user applications that that some of our customers uh, have have gone through here. Just uh, two or three quick ones. And then we'll pass it over to, to the rest of the guests to, to highlight some of the applications and where they're using Spot today. Um, so one of, the, one of the first ones that I wanted to highlight is, is British Petroleum. Um, you may have seen some news articles recently. Uh, BP has been testing Spot for inspection for its remote facilities for, for actually a couple years. They were one of our earliest early adopters and we were working with them before as, as a beta customer. Really, they're looking at how do we get to hard to reach areas such as the middle of the ocean, deserts, you know, refineries, and, and start to do useful things with Spot. So uh, recently they deployed Spot onto a, an oil rig called Mad Dog um, out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the main, the main task for this application is to put robots to work doing things that human inspectors have traditionally done. Things like laser scanning, uh, things like scanning for anomalies, doing uh, computer vision, as, as Kevin mentioned, universities are starting to look at, tracking things like corrosion, or just checking analog gauges. Um, and so that it's been really exciting to see BP take this offshore. It's been out there for the last three months. Um, and you know their team is, is very excited about this. Really, it's, it's about getting people away from these dangerous tasks. You know, there's, there's a lot of dangerous situations out on an oil rig and, and BP is excited, as you can see in this quote, about getting people out of, that, uh, out of that environment and having a robot with the right sensors to do those tasks. Another, uh, another use case that has been in the news recently is Chernobyl. So um, we at Boston Dynamics, we have a lot of engineers uh, that are, are kind of geeks, nuclear geeks, if you will. So we were really excited about this use case. Um, it was a lot of fun to see, see Spot going into uh, an environment and, and what it did at Chernobyl was really enter areas that humans haven't been able to go into. And in those areas, it was performing radiation scanning to understand what the levels of radiation were and some general mapping, LIDAR mapping, in order to um, provide you know, a, a model, uh, basically a digital twin that they can later use for, for various purposes. Um, so again, a, an area where Spot went into a dangerous environment um, that humans haven't been able to go into and, and collect some real useful information. Um, the last one that I'll highlight, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to our guests to go, to go in depth of how they're using Spot, is the NYPD. So the NYPD started deploying Spot this summer. Um, some of their primary use cases have been fielding uh, Spot in order to respond to barricaded suspect, active shooter situations, 
or hostage situations. So they're using SPOT again to go into uh, a dangerous environment, get eyes on a situation, and um, and in most cases, you know, bring that situation, hopefully de-escalate that situation. Um, they're excited about making the entry safer, more efficient than track vehicles. SPOT can go down a stairwell very quickly. And as, as Kevin men, mentioned, when you look at tracked or wheeled vehicles that were historically used, you know, those take much longer period of time. So, so you can do inspections much more quickly. Uh, here's a quote from the NYPD. You know, at the end of the day, they're looking for the dog to save lives, protect people and protect the officers. So we're, we're super thrilled to, to see SPOT and, uh, and how it can help in that, that goal. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to the rest of our guests and they can uh, talk a little bit more about how they're using SPOT uh, here in the last few months. All right, thank you, Tim. So one of the things uh, that we, we really like about today is we're showing you the real stuff. So this is not uh, Steven Spielberg type Hollywood camera crews coming in and filming this. This is real stuff out in the field, spots getting scratched up, a lot of cell cam footage. So um, so I hope you'll appreciate the uh, the reality of what we're doing and, uh, and we'll talk specifically uh, uh, to some of those things with the people that have actually done that. So, um, for my first uh, guest, I would like to introduce uh, Matt McKinnon from UAS Inc. Matt is a, an underground specialist for uh, all things autonomous, aerial and ground, and really was one of the, really one of the pioneers in terms of interest in spot uh, for underground. And uh, he's done some incredible projects um, for, uh, for testing spot in underground environments in the mines, which are being incredible. So. Um, so I'll pass it over to Matt for a quick introduction. And Matt, tell us why you thought about SPOT and what, what got you uh, into wanting to test, uh, test them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Kevin. So um, yeah, no, the, the biggest reason that uh, we were drawn to SPOT is with, with being initially an aerial service provider in the sense of using um, traditional drones or multi-rotor technology to get into uh, a lot of the spaces. Um, a lot of times there were issues with um, the, the ceiling, the back of the roof, whatever, um, having material hanging down. Um, having material hanging down. And it would be um, an issue with Um, and what the problem was, it was be, it would be too tight for our drones to be able to fly into. So for us, the solution to that is being able to take a, either a wheeled, uh, tracked or legged robot, um, and be able to get in there. So we did a lot of testing with different, um, wheeled and different tracked robots, but they all have the same shortcoming with the underground environments that we operate in, in that they get hung up very easily and there's very minimal ground clearance um, to have a unit that's of, of reasonable size that, that can be manned portable in these, in these areas. So um, when we found out that spot was available to the public, yeah, we, we reached out um, primarily because of the ability to have good ground clearance. So to be able to step over obstacles and objects that are um, eight inches tall um, and be able to get around a lot of the material that's left on the ground. Um, yeah, Spot's been really, uh, really surprising how well he's been performing, especially given it's a completely lightless environment. So there's zero, there's not even one single photon that gets down to the, the depth that we're at. And for Spot to be able to operate without um, any additional lighting, so to be able to operate Spot and have them be able to identify um, fiducials as well as just be able to navigate and have his locomotion in a completely lightless environment was uh, quite, was quite impressive. So we have a, we have a couple of videos. Um, I think Kevin's going to be able to cue them up of just some different testing that we were doing with spot throughout different mining processes. I believe we're going to show um, some of the downstream at the end of the process in, down into the mill and then the smelter. 
So we have spot walking around um, one of the converters as well as uh, in a in a condemned abandoned area. Do you want to cue those up, Kevin? So in this video here, they're they're actually tapping the hot metal out of the converter. So we we're just doing some testing with the uh, the hover map, the laser scanner um, on top of spot. And we had the opportunity to just be able to get up and map this area. And, and with the uh, the hot metal flowing out, it just kind of gave a good opportunity to get a couple of good shots. But it also just shows how spot can operate in all different conditions, whether it be from cool to hot. And then this one here is um, spot actually operating um, in a condemned area. So there's actually, you're not allowed in this area. Um, this area we could potentially operate our drones in, but there's a lot of limitations as far as battery life that are addressed with spot. So having the ability to operate for over an hour um, and be able to map these areas and get around easily is is a huge advantage over a lot of the traditional um, drone technology where you're limited by battery life, essentially. And then the so other Matt, main, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, sorry, Matt. So just talk a little bit about the kind of results you were getting with scanners and, and the scans you picked up from doing those things. How, how were the results with SWAT? Uh, the results with Spot have been uh, amazing. So we, we're actually a little bit um, spoiled in the sense that we we're able to mount the MSN hover map scanner on top. So with it being a slam based scanner, we don't need to stop the scan like a lot of the other systems. So we're not limited to where we can get Spot into with that. So if, it, if we can fit Spot into it, we can essentially scan those areas. So it's been um, pretty interesting to see all the different areas that we're able to get it into and not have to shut down those areas specifically. So just be able to keep production up and going and have spot lock in, be able to map that area that normally they'd have to shut down and have a whole process to be able to allow um, humans to be able to enter into that area to be able to do a traditional scan. So yeah, no, it's been um, incredible, in incredible uh, on surface. So tell us a little bit, Matt, uh, before we queue up the next couple of videos. So tell us a little bit about the Kid Creek Mine up there in Sudbury, which is in uh, northern Ontario, Canada, for those, uh, for those of you that were wondering. Uh, this may or may not have been the site of the infamous uh, spot, uh, spot Twitter video that came out a while ago. Um, so Matt, give us a little bit of history of the mine and what, what some of their issues are before we show some of those videos. Yeah, so... Um, Kid Creek's actually, um, they've been great partners just in over the years of just working with them with integrating this the new technology. So mining in general has been burnt um, a lot of times by a lot of broken promises, we'll say, um, with technology, being able to do um, what what people are saying it could do. And, and now we're at a point now where the technology has actually gotten up to a point where it's able to get into these areas. So. Um, Kid Creek, fortunately, hasn't been jaded by that and still allows new tech to be tested out. And they have it actually um, quite, a, quite an unusual um, layout and, and uh, I guess you can say uh, accolade in that they're the deepest base metal mine um, in the world. So they're the closest to the center of the earth based off their northern latitude um, with being, I believe they're now three kilometers um, below sea level. So with that mine though, they also have the advantage of they're a fully integrated mine with um, Wi-Fi at, at, at every face. So down underground, there's you can access basically the internet anywhere within the production part of the mine. So for us, it's been huge for Spot because one of the big advantages of Spot is being able to teleoperate them. So you don't need necessarily um, a human operator to be walking behind Spot to be able to operate it but you do need um, reliable Wi-Fi connection. So with Kid Creek um, having a fiber backbone and needing near zero latency to be able to operate their scoop trams, it's a great place to be able to bring spot in and test them out. So there's a lot of areas when they do blasts, um, they need to clear the gases and get proper readings. But when they do the blast, they can't put any instruments in this, the, the direct area because they get damaged. So what ends up happening is depending on the type of blast it takes them it could take them sometimes over a day to be able to clear that area to get guys in there to be able to start working it so to be able to have spot 
um, and in a essentially a doghouse on the docking bay on the charging station. And Tim will talk about that a little later. Um, to have them be able to be down underground, already ready to go. And if they have a blast, because they can't have people down there to be able to get those readings, um, they can activate spot and have them walk in and be able to do um, these readings in areas that they just can't access normally without actually sending humans down there. So Kid Creek is, is being, yeah, just the perfect poster child for being able to show what this technology can do. Um, and a lot of the mines, because they're going, they're all going deeper. Um, all the low hanging fruit, if you will, in the mining world has been um, mined out for the most part. So a lot of the really good ore bodies are unfortunately located in places where humans, it's just inhospitable for them to uh, operate in. So they're gonna need this technology to be able to access these ore bodies. And it's great to have Kid Creek and other mines that we're working with um, in Sudbury on board to be able to uh, to bring this technology in and actually involve it in their day-to-day -day use. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Um, so just a quick housekeeping note. If you do have any questions, feel free to uh, to ask them in the chat box. We will uh, we will address them at the end in the Q and A. Um, so if something uh, pops into your mind, go ahead and just uh, just add it. Uh, Add it in there. So um, we will go into more detail on some of those uh, some of those different options that Matt talked about uh, towards the end. Um, for now, though, again, Kid Creek was a great opportunity to uh, to really test some of this. And the biggest thing is, as as I said in the intro, is really the step one, which is can you get spot there, and then is he able to walk around and and function while he's there. So we're going to show you a couple of videos from the Kid Creek mine. Again, this is the deepest, deepest mine in the world. Um, and we're going to show you a couple of different videos, which give you a good idea of some of the uh, some of the inhospitable uh, uh, areas that we're looking at. So, Jace, if you want to go ahead and uh, and play those two for us. Yeah, so this video here, this one's actually on surface. Um, it was inside of a large um, fluid duct. Um, so we were just testing spot out on essentially unstructured stairs. So spot operates amazing on um, regular steps, but with a lot of these areas that we're asked to operate in, it isn't um, proper eight inch rise with a proper 10 inch or 12 inch step. And it's variable depending on the grade. So this gave us a great opportunity to get spot in there and actually see him surprisingly operate uh, quite well. He did have a couple trip ups on some of the areas where some of the board spacing was a little wide. Um, and just his positioning. But aside from that, it was, yeah, he, uh, he did quite well. And then this one is just some of our, from some of our testing um, that we were doing underground. This is from some of the earlier ones when we were doing some different stuff. We were working with trying some different cameras and FPV setups with lighting on board. So um, we ended up primarily operating a lot of the areas without the camera on board. So a lot of the scope um scans that we ended up doing with spot we would just operate them back from the remote stand walk spot in um essentially have them look around kind of look up uh when we were able to capture the in the entire scope with uh one quick little uh walk with spot into the scope so for traditionally for them to be able to do that with a wheeled or a tracked robot they have to spend a bit of extra time making sure they make the ground as flat as they can and remove any large rocks or, or any debris that's on the floor Whereas Spot was able to very, very easily get over all those um, all those rocks without any extra care. So it was basically a, a regular scope as if they were getting ready to put up the fill fence um, and wasn't given any specific cleaning and Spot was able to operate very, very effectively in those areas. Perfect, Matt. So just, uh, just to kind of finish off your section, so tell us, what what's next what what is now that you've done this what's coming up and what are, are the most obvious applications for uh for the mining space yeah no a lot of what's next is just trying um a lot of the different accessories that are available so the manipulator is a big one that has a lot of interest um as well as the camera so being able to um, use the manipulator to go in to retrieve um explosives and other things that are inside the scope as well as potentially help assist with any trapped scoops to be able to go in and help guide when they're hooking on um so and as well as fall the grounds 
So there's a lot of different sensors as well as we're working with uh, another local company, Accutron, um, on integrating their gas sensors on board. So they're running um, a really, really awesome gas sensor that we can just strap right on to spot, be able to integrate right in with the API and yeah, be able to stream the data up the surface if it's, uh, if it's a wired mine. So there's, there's a lot of applications. Fantastic. Well, Matt, thanks very much. We know you got a skew, so thank you for uh, for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing uh, much more stuff from uh, from you, you and Kid Creek and UAS uh, in the future. So thanks for joining us. So let's uh, let's thank pass you. things let's, let's pass things along now. We're going to talk about. Um, it's actually it's it's interesting. Um, certainly up up north of the border here in Canada, we've had. We've had several early adopters for Spot, actually. I don't know what it is. Uh, we tend to be really shy about these things uh, in Canada, but New Brunswick Power was one of the first power companies to uh, to test out Spot. I think they've been on a couple of uh, webinars with, with BD. Um, but we're really excited. So Ontario Power Generation, OPG, who is the uh, largest generator uh, in, uh, in Canada, um, they are uh, the early adopters, certainly in Ontario, and uh, and they are uh, joining us today with uh, one of their lead technicians, uh, Eddie Joe. So Eddie, um, welcome. Just give us a quick intro. But you you just took delivery of Spot two weeks ago. So tell us why you decided to choose Spot. What what made it? And then how have your first two weeks been? Hi everyone. My name is Eddie. So uh, so we only had the Spot for two weeks, but we have been trying to use it every day. Uh, we currently have a fleet of robot that's um, called truck mounted chassis kind of with uh, rubber tracks. Um, we find a lot, the biggest challenge is staircases and we have areas where we go to, uh, we need to get to have uh, graded stairs and that we always have chopped in the past. Now we have spot, uh, we can get there pretty easily. And um, and then when we first, uh, first time Kevin brought a uh, spot to demo on station, we have four, um, I stand and watching how this robot gonna operate uh, within 10, 15 minutes. And we all had to try to you know, control the robot up and down stairs. And that was amazing. And we thought, this is this is great. This is this can really uh, change how we operate the robot in the past. Perfect. So so how how easy was it for people to to pick up? I know I know the young guys play play lots of video games, seem to pick it up. But you had you had some old guys too. So what what was the overall impression for the team of uh, of using Spot when you first got them? Yeah, like you said, it's similar to a remote control joystick and uh, even just tap on the tablet. You can control the robot and make it walk straight. Um, so I've been taking the robot to some of the shift crew guys and um, I do a quick demo and ask them to try it out. And I would say the, the feedback is very positive and I've generated a mass amount of interest. So one of my main goals is to have um, a robot operators, spa oper operators on every shift, every crew, so make sure that in the station 24 seven have someone able to use spot to do inspections. Fantastic. So, so take us all the way back to the beginning when you and 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 Neil and Mike and the gang were were talking about it. Where, where did you think? Oh, we should use Spot there. What 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 was what was it really that drove you to try the technology? Um, so originally, we actually had a one idea in head. It's one of the locations we call the Bex Tank. It's about three floors high and just stairway after stairway. So uh, there's no no way for us to control the robot up there in the past. Now, um, this is the first thing we're gonna try to use Spot to go up there. And now we have the uh, wireless extender. We're gonna try that out. And uh, as we started getting hands-on practice more, uh, station are made aware of we have this such amazing uh, robot and they have come to us for uh, help. Uh, even just a couple hours before this meeting, um, one of my uh, friend from another station asked me to support on one of the mission. So, so once we gather interest and everyone thinks it's so easy to control, and we'll get them, uh, we'll get them involved. And uh, I like to have more, more people get hands on and you know, try out, push to its limit, and who knows, maybe we'll get more of it, make a wolf pack out of it. Okay. All right. 
So, uh, so Jace, if you want to go ahead and show that video, and then Eddie's got a couple of videos and pictures he's going to share and kind of explain the use case. So, um, so Jace, go ahead, and then Eddie, if you want to talk about a little bit about what we're seeing, we can do that. Sure. Um, so this is in one of our decommissioned unit. Um, the location is in call service room where a uh, fueling machine is. Uh, can do reactor being very unique that we can perform on power uh, fueling. So that's how we make our unit run like almost a thousand days. So this is one of this advantage of a can do reactor. And so in the past we have had a fueling machine having mechanical issue and inspections have always been challenging. Um, so this is a test run in one of our decommissioning unit. And we just want to see how easy it is within half a minute. We're able to get up close and take a look. So this will be one of this task and application we'll be using for the future. Fascinating, and that is the uh, that is the Spot Cam Plus with the PTZ on there, so you can zoom right in to uh, to get some incredible footage. So, Eddie, I'm going to pass it back to you, and you can uh, share your screen and share some of your other imagery uh, that you've you've taken here. Sure, I like to just share my screen quickly. So this is one of the test runs we performed uh, the other day. We were preparing for the uh, operation. So where my partner standing is behind a lead-infused brick wall. And he's practicing controlling the robot to perform the mission. And uh, where he's standing is called the low-dose waiting area. So he's not being affected by the radiation. And we're using spot to conduct the mission and as you can see the tablet spots almost at a staircase where we need to investigate and inspect the equipment. So this is all within one hour. We're able to complete the mission. We usually take a close an hour for just under two minutes. So the intuitive control has really amazed a lot of uh, uh, our staff here and that's so yeah um, the usability being so easy is it really amazed us, and that's why we have an idea of expanding the program and uh, make more people um, to try it out and to get hands on to see how easy it is. All right, I can uh, stop this sharing. Eddie, did you have a couple more images that you wanted to share with us? Um, I believe Jace have a couple of the pictures and he can queue it up and then I can explain what's, uh, what's behind those images. Okay, Jace, over to you, my friend. Actually, no, I don't have those images, Mar. I couldn't import those. Oh, no? Eddie, oh, okay. if, if you've got those, uh -huh. uh, Go ahead and share those, Eddie, if you would. Sure. Um, so yeah, so along with Spot, we also uh, procured um, uh, Cam Plus. So that's one of the very powerful inspection tool we're really to uh, really excited to use. And I've done a few test runs, and the result has been amazing. Sorry very glitchy well i can just talk about it um so with 30 times zoom uh, capability with spot we are really um we can put in spotting uh out of harm's way we can look from far and uh, with the uh, industrial environment we have um, radioactive gas and um, liquid we can keep our operator away from the hazard as well so New Brunswick Power used the spot to um, use auto walk function. That's something we're also to um, looking to explore, um, creating some sort of simple route for spot to conduct uh, data in some very hazardous environment. So, yeah, we're looking to share with the uh, RMUS team in the near future.
And um, uh, so I'd like to use this opportunity to thank RMUS and the Boston Dynamic. And when we first had a connectivity issue and you guys are uh, ready to support and very short notice and lending us equipment to let us test out and getting ready for our uh, few missions. Yeah, it's great. Um, we, we we appreciate we appreciate you guys being brave enough to test all this stuff. And I'll, I'll ask you about some of the upcoming tests. But first, um, I want to share uh, another video from yesterday. One of the things Matt touched upon it in the mines and Eddie touched upon it there is having access to Wi-Fi and different methods of the communication system. So um, uh, OPG has a couple of upcoming inspections that are going to require longer range and more enhanced communications. So, Jason, if you want to just quickly show uh, that last video from OPG yesterday. So what you can see is, um, and I'll let Eddie talk to this in a second, but on the back there, you'll see that radio and antenna system. That is a Ragent ES1. We have one of those on spot and one of those on the controller. And the two of those will basically give you, depending on their hundreds of meters range and a lot more uh, interference resistance. You can also use nodes that you can post at various intervals so you can have complete coverage over, over any area. So this is gonna be key once we get into automating like long multi-kilometer um, missions. So this one is just an inspection. So Eddie, why don't you tell us a little bit about that piece of equipment there and what you would be, uh, what you would be expect, excuse me, inspecting on that particular piece of equipment there. So that's our uh, turbine generator on one of the decommissioned units. So um, one of the biggest hazards we have with generators is hydrogen. Uh, um, if it, that's what will be a running unit, uh, active unit, we'll have uh, all the sprinkler system built around it um, just in case. And hydrogen being one of the big hazards, burning with no color. So it's hard to, um, when we when an operator approach that hazard, we're very careful. Um, so we have a gas detector. Now with spot being available, now we can throw a gas detector on it and then approach it appropriately, um, putting our operator out of harm's way. Fantastic. Okay, so last thing, Eddie, tell us about what's what's the next thing? What are you what are you going to be testing in uh, in your in your second month that you've had spot? Um like I said, we're continuing exploring the opportunity, and I just got called this morning about the using spot and different station. So I'll work with them on that and see if we can bring spot to there at Donaldson Nuclear Generating Station. Um, and we notice, uh, uh, we know that spot arm is coming out soon, and we're looking to um, having that, uh, you know, um, operating a valve is one of the functions we want to have that capability where we can. Um, operate some very sensitive equipment and put the operator out of this dangerous uh, radiation field. Um, it's funny, like I actually have been in that position where I have to operate a valve in a 4,000 milligram field. And uh, apparently that's higher than SPOT have exposed in the past. So I'd like to see how SPOT is, uh, is doing that task. See if he's better than me. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm I'm sure he's different than you anyway, Eddie. But yeah, some of the some of the fascinating things we're looking forward to is is being able to to test and see what kind of a dose uh, spot is capable of. Uh, and again, a lot of those special things we're we're willing to work with our early adopters to make sure we're able to test those safely. And uh, and anyway, OPG has a number of use cases in different groups and. Uh, and uh, again, Eddie and Neil and his team and then Umar on the innovation team, they've all been wonderful uh, and we'll continue to do that uh, as I'm sure will Michael over at New Brunswick Power. So it's so really, really excellent and thanks for, uh, for joining us. So we had a couple of segues there about turning valves and remote operations. So uh, what better to do than to pass it along, uh, pass it back to Tim uh, to tell us about uh, some of those new applications that are going to be coming out in 2021. So, Tim, take it away, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's it's always great to hear those uh, those user stories. You know, it's it's really exciting anytime someone says, "Hey, Spot's been able to save us uh, dose." is is great to hear that that Spot is doing that. So, um, I appreciate the. The stories from OPG and from Matt. Um, so, you know, as 
something that's most exciting for us is, is we're seeing users and, and we saw two here today that they're really getting value out of spot and what it's what it's able to do right now, what it's able to do today. But you know, potentially more exciting is we have a lot of things planned for the first quarter of next year. Um, and this will really enable our clients to take spot to to the next level. So that's uh, I'm excited to talk you through some of uh, some of that and what's what's coming down in the future. Um, first up is is the spot enterprise package. So this is really what users are going to need to to fully automate sensing and inspection, whether it's in these remote areas or in these hazardous environments. Um, this will really allow users to, to utilize a self-charging dock. This, uh, this version of Spot will allow users to, to use this self-charging dock. And it will also allow them to perform longer auto walk inspection, which is the autonomous stack that, that Spot has on it. Um, and, and really it will help users, you know, realize a greater autonomy of their robots. So they're not having to do a manual battery change um, and they can they can get greater autonomy out of the robot in their sites. Um, so we actually have a video of of the dock. This is kind of what, what it looks like, but uh, Jace, if you wouldn't mind running that video. Um, so, you know, really this, this self-charging station, it's gonna transform Spot into a truly autonomous remote inspection system. And, and it's really exciting. Matt, Matt mentioned a few, uh, having a doghouse and putting a, a dock in that doghouse, but really, you know, users can have multiple docks um, and across their facility and kind of link missions together so that it can go from one dock to another and continue to perform those missions. So that's really exciting for us. Um, the next next piece is uh, Scout. And, and this, you know, it's, it's always great to hear the user stories of how easy our controller application um, is to use. And it's really exciting to hear that. But some of our earliest feedback was, hey, it'd be, it'd be great if we could take that ease of use and bring it to a control room or, you know, in the times of COVID, bring it to a home office. So that's really what we've been working on over the past several months is, is allowing that to happen. So, Jace, we have a video on, on Scout. Why don't you run that and I can talk through it a little bit more. So, so Scout is, is basically you put Spot on an enterprise Wi-Fi network. You put a site appliance on an enterprise Wi-Fi network. And you're able to do these things from, from your workstation. So you could have a control room with multiple monitors where you're able to see Spot's video feeds. You can VPN in and be at your home office and control spot, manipulate spot, and see what spot is, is actually seeing. So, you know, we, we see this as essential to, to allow users to really take remote inspection to the next level and, uh, and get more value. So, you know, in Eddie's case, the operator was standing right behind a, a lead wall, but you know, how great would it be if he could be back in a control room and, and be operating spot from that area? And that's that's what Scout is going to enable. So we're really excited to uh, start introducing and deploying that to users um, early next year. Um, on on the note of taking inspection to to the next level, um, you know, Eddie Eddie talked about the SpotCam Plus, um, which is a great tool. It it allows you to have PTZ functionality um, with RGB cameras. But the, the spot cam IR really, again, takes, takes a remote inspection to the next level by giving you a thermal camera um, on, top of, on top of that RGB camera. So you can pan tilt a thermal camera and start to look at things like thermal anomaly detections. Um, and and you can, also has a boom mic so you can start to do uh, directional acoustic sensing and, and hear when things may be going wrong in a facility. Um, last but certainly not least is is the spot arm. Um, you know, as you start to be able to collect data in the world, uh, that's that's great. It's always great to be able to collect data in these remote environments or in these dangerous hazardous environments. But the next step is okay. How do you start to manipulate things that that you may have inspected? And that's really where the spot manipulation arm comes into play. Um, 
you know, the classic case could be a, a remote substation. Maybe spot sees, senses a thermal anomaly with, with that spot cam plus IR. And then, you know, after it senses that, you want to go and throw a breaker. And that's exactly what the arm is designed to do, is allowing supervised autonomy of, of manipulation tasks. You know, another, another use case for that would be spot again, sees a leak through, through its cameras or through some sort of additional sensor that's on spot. And then after it sees that leak, the first thing you would do is want to turn a valve to shut down that leak. And so that's what the manipulation uh, arm will enable. Jace, you can run the video we have of, of the manipulation arm and I'll, I'll talk through a little bit more. So really what this is going to uh, involve is, is what we call supervised autonomy. In this case, all the user was doing on the, on the control interface was tapping where this door handle was and the direction the hinges were. And Spot does everything else on its own. This is a push door. What's even more impressive is, is, impressive is a pull door because Spot is manipulating its body to hold that door open. In this case, all the user was doing to pick up this drill is pressing the drill, showing, you know, using Spot's body cam images to tell the robot where the drill is, and then Spot picks it up. The user takes control, moves it over to this bin, and then can drop, uh, drop the drill there. You know, the next piece we're looking at is these constrained manipulation tasks. How do you turn something? How do you, uh, you know, manipulate something, whether it's a valve, whether it's a breaker, whether it's a cabinet door? Um, we're also excited to see how Spot can use its legs combined with the arm to do things like dragging tasks, um, which will really help in these antagonistic environments. So those are a few of the products that, that we're really excited about. We think it can uh, continue to, to really change how people are using robots in their day-to-day -day operations and enhance the value um, not only from what, what Matt and Nettie shared today, the value they're getting out of Spot today, but really take that to the next level. Um, so excited to see RMUS, uh, OPG, Kid Creek, and, and all the other users uh, north of the border and, and in the US, um, you know, get real value out of Spot. And uh, from there, I'll, I'll pass it back to Kevin. You can, uh, we can uh, probably field some questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. We're really excited about all the uh, all the new opportunities um, for Spot, both here and uh, and uh, uh, in the U.S. As we said, um, so Jace, is there any particular questions or anything we have in there that we can maybe address? Yes, we do. Uh, we got a couple of them in here. Uh, some of them from the same, some of them not. Uh, but first off uh battery life and operating temperature maybe tim uh you might be able to to build those fairly easily and additionally um is it intrinsically safe yeah great questions so battery life is is 90 minutes um so you know a couple couple of things there you can either swap the battery uh with each spot you do get two batteries so you can manually swap the battery or really that docking station um, can take things to the next level where you are you are docking and, and spot is charging itself um, as far as operating temperatures go um, it can operate up to 45 degrees c um, is its, its high-end operating temperature um, and uh, you know really when you get to that level what, what's happening is, is the battery life is being degraded. So you start to see uh, poor performance in the battery. But, but after 45, there could be other uh, ramifications to, to both the battery and Spot itself. Um, as far as the intrinsically safe question, Spot is not intrinsically safe. It, it is not ATEX certified. Um, you know, you, you may be asking that because of the BP use case. How do you take it on an offshore oil rig? Um, and really the, the key there is they're operating spot with a hot work permit um, so that you're able to use, uh, use spot in those types of environments, just as you would, you know, if you were doing other tasks that could create a spark, whether it's, um, 
you know, welding or operating a cell phone or a computer, you know, you get hot work permits for those tasks and you need to do the same for, for spot. Sure. Uh, can you speak a little more? Uh, do, can you can you cite a spec for uh, the the lowest and highest operating temperature? I think that's operating environment uh, specifically. Yeah. So so the uh, the highest operating temperature is is forty five degrees C, um, and then the the lowest uh, I believe is negative twenty degrees C. Got you. Perfect. Um, then we got another one. Uh, maybe you could speak a little more about this and is uh, how can you transmit a signal? Uh, let's see. How are they transmitting the signal when spot operates a significant distance from the operator? Um, I think uh, that's something that Matt had touched on a little bit with the extended Wi-Fi networks. Maybe you could give a little more insight into that. Yeah, so out of the box, Spot is using point-to-point -point Wi-Fi between the the controller and, uh, and and Spot itself. So so there's definitely some limitations in how far you can go. A few ways around that is is to utilize an enterprise network. So in some of the mines that Matt is taking Spot into, they're actually placing Spot on that enterprise network. There's some settings that you have to adjust. Um, but then you you just play spot on that enterprise network and you can operate as long as the controller and spot are on the network, you can operate it really from anywhere where you're on that network. Um, the same is true with the site appliance and and you know the upcoming scout platform. The other way which which Eddie uh, is doing is is to add a mesh radio to spot. So in that case, um, Kevin mentioned the Ragent radio. So you're adding a Ragent radio, connecting that into Spot's Ethernet port, and then adding another node uh, to the controller so that um, you get a, a basically a longer distance um, or uh, the ability to have longer distance communication between the robot and the controller. Sure. Uh, but maybe Eddie, uh, Eddie. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, uh, I was gonna say Spot is, is truly comms agnostic. So whether it's a mesh radio, if we have users that are putting it on a 4G or a 5G network um, and all that's very feasible. Cool, and then maybe, I don't know, Eddie, could you potentially add a little more as to as to kind of what you guys have done to, to create that longer distance? Um, and what we saw in that video there that you had that, uh, that additional kind of module on there, is there anything you could add potentially to that? Uh, yeah, like we only got it yesterday and we're test out in the field. Um, so one of the biggest challenge we have is a lead shielded bricks um, to protect uh, um, harmful radiation to our operators. So the next step we'll be trying is to see if we can get around it. And if we can, that will really expand how we um, inspect the, the containment building. So that's something we're looking to try and uh, see where we can get. Cool. I think I think the overarching thing is that uh, you know we haven't really tapped um, everything that that's capable of. It's it you know with the with what you've talked about is there's there's more to come, and uh, you know the possibility you know it just extends from here. When more people get their hands on it, the more they get to play around with it. So it's cool. Um, another one: Could the arm potentially operate a power tool like a drill? I think maybe Tim uh, might you might be able to speak a little bit more. Uh, you know, uh, just elaborate a little more on the capabilities, the uh, and maybe some of the limitations of the uh, of the arm itself, and and where it's looking to go in the future. Yeah. So great, great question. Interesting question. Um, you know, what the arm is going to be capable of uh, early part of next year is really focused on picking things, uh, picking and placing things. So picking objects. Um, some of the tasks that we've heard, you know, in, in the nuclear space is, is there's sensors that need to live in an environment for, you know, six to 12 hours to get a, an accurate reading. And so picking and placing those remote sensing devices is, is an application that we've heard recently, um, which is, is very feasible. The other use cases are opening opening doors, the kind of classic one that a lot of people think of the, the arm is going to enable. 
and then these constraint manipulation tasks, which are, are turning, twisting, pulling, um, whether that's cabinets, drawers, uh, valves, cranks, you know, that's, that's something that we're really focused on. Operating a power tool is, is pretty complex. And I, I would say it's not something that, that is an immediate focus, but, you know, with where we're at with the arm, we're very interested in hearing, hey, what does create value? So if there's use cases that our customers are saying, hey, there could be tremendous value by having this or that functionality, we're, we're very eager to hear that feedback and to really understand how the arm can, uh, can provide value in, in different industries. Sure, that makes sense. I could see you know, at some point in the future, you, you, instead of a specifically like a hand attachment, maybe you have another type of attachment that would manipulate something like that. And again, probably one of those that's just in the future. Yeah, and, and we, we've heard that before. We've thought about that. So, you know, in the future, the, the gripper that you see on spot would be able to, to potentially be removed. Um, so that is, is a possibility, um, you know, as, as we start to explore different applications. Sure, sure. I get. I mean, hey, we're you're making really cool new tech. Uh, there's always, there, you know, there's always something coming down the rail. Um, then another one we've got uh, is there an HDMI out on the controller? Uh, I think I can answer this. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we, I believe, we did that a little bit with our promotional video that you can find on our YouTube site. So. Yeah, that's that's correct. There's a HDMI out of the the. JXD tablet. Cool. Um, let's see here. What else do we've got? Uh, is there head tracking on the PTZ camera payload? Hmm. Uh, could you speak to that at all? So, so there's no intelligence built into the the PTC PTZ payload itself, um, but. You know, a lot of the software, some of our software partners are focused on computer vision models, not necessarily people tracking, but but other types of CV models, such as on a fire watch application, is a fire extinguisher where it should be, or is a hose where it should be, or, you know, in the case of gauge reading, um, what does this analog gauge say? So there's, you know, a lot of intelligence that some of our partners are building into um, to, to process data that's collected by the PTZ camera, um, but it's not something that's native uh, with with the camera when, when it comes out of the box. Gotcha. Um, then I think uh, one of our last questions here is how much weight can it drag? Uh, my guess is it probably depends on uh, the nature of like, you know, what's the floor like? What is the box? What is something that like, if it's a box, what is the, you know, is it a hard rubber bottom that's supposed to be grippy? I think, uh, you know, that could probably depend on the scenario. Maybe you could speak a little more about that. Yeah, yeah, great question. And you, you hit it right on the nose. It's, it's very tough with the coefficients of friction and you know, what the surface is to say, hey, what can it actually drag? Um, We've tested it dragging items about uh, 25 kilograms, um, so I think around 55 pounds on a carpeted surface. Um, you know, there's there's pros and cons to, to a more slippery surface. Obviously, something will drag quicker, but but also there's traction things with with spot. So um, it's tough to really give a spec for the max drag capacity, but uh, the 25 kilograms on carpet is is one of this you know tests that we have done. sure I, i'd say there's a lot of variables uh in that equation i think it's probably the safe answer there's a, there's a lot of variables there so um i think that pretty much wraps it up with any of the questions that we've got right here uh if kevin why not uh, unless somebody has some else, i mean kevin go ahead and uh and wrap us up here so all right, so I want to thank everybody for, for joining us. So from all of us here at uh, RMUS, the best producer in the business, Jace from HQ, uh, from myself here, from John's hairdresser, and, uh, and our friend Spot, 
we say thank you very much for joining us and uh, have yourselves a great holiday. And we'll look forward to seeing you in uh, January, where hopefully we will have a lower table. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great holiday.